Oh, back again. I thought it might be fun to possibly talk a little bit more about the vascular system by looking at some radiographic vascular images, some angiograms and things like that, that might give you a better idea um, in the real world as to what you actually see uh, when you do uh, some of these images. So let's go ahead and get that started here. First of all, this is just a typical chest x-ray. Okay, and I just want to show sort of the image and the direction and the position of where the heart lies within the chest. Okay, first of all, you can see the clavicle. Here's a clavicle right here. Here's a clavicle right here. You can see the trachea. That darker area right there would be the trachea. And we're starting to see ribs. Now, the, the problem is the posterior ribs you'll see back here. And the ribs will actually look like they, they link around or they loop around this way, okay? So you'll see them looping and looping and looping. So this would be the anterior rib, and where you see it actually coming up in here, that would be the posterior portion of the rib in the back, okay? So we see the ribs. Uh, this is a full inspiration type of an x-ray. A uh, couple of things I wanna also show about a typical normal chest x-ray. If we look at the right diaphragm, it's a little bit higher than the left. And the reason why is the liver sits down in here. So the liver is sitting in this area right here. And so therefore, usually the area of the right hemidiaphragm is slightly higher than the left. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about inspiration versus expiration films in, in a little bit. Okay. But anyway, let me just go to the heart and try to show you a little bit of what, what we actually see here in the area of the heart. This area right here, and we, we talked about in the class how really the left side of the heart is really more posterior and the right side of the heart is a little bit more anterior. And the heart, instead of being vertical, is actually tipped a little bit towards the left and downwards. Okay. Sort of angled. At, a, at sort of like an, a direction going this way. So this area right here that we see is basically imaging what we see of the right atrium. The left ventricle actually is sitting right here, sort of on the di di diaphragm in this area in front of the area of the left ventricle, because this area over here is the left ventricle in here. Let me use a different color. So this area right in here would be the left ventricle. And then this area up in the top right here would be the left atrium, okay? So that's what we'd see there. So actually you're seeing, again, the right atrium sort of just to the left side um, uh, on the image here. Uh, and this area right here would be the left, would be the right atrium. Here'd be the right ventricle sitting right here. This right here is the left ventricle. And here's the left atrium that sits right in there. So it's pretty easy to see. A couple other things I want to point out here that you might want to look at. This right here is the aortic arch. As the aorta swings, because the aorta we know is coming from, as we talked about in the class, comes from the left ventricle, actually swings this way and around. And so it's going, uh, initially it's, it's, it's heading superiorly and a little bit towards the right side over here, because this is right, actually, this is left, as we would know. It's heading from inferior to superior, a little bit towards of for left to right. Then finally, it gets to that aortic arch. This is the area of the aortic arch. You can see this is the area where the brachiocephalic artery would be. There would be the left uh, carotid, and there would be the left subclavian sitting right there. But then all of it's swinging posteriorly. And as it swings posteriorly, the aorta all the way through the thoracic cavity is slightly to the right side of the thoracic vertebrae. And actually see right here, we actually see the thoracic vertebrae. There's a vertebral disc. 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 So that aorta is going to be slung slightly to the right, all the way down. It's going to be following down and we'll go through a whole or a hiatus in the backs of the diaphragm, which we'll talk about in the GI system a little bit more. But that's what we see here. Now, what we also see in this area here is we see some grayer shadows. They're not very dark, okay? Or they're not very white. Little grayer shadows here and the shadows right here. And basically, this these are all... Uh, 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 pulmonary markings, okay? Basically, what we'll see is there the pulmonary trunk, which is basically the, you know, uh, area the pulmonary, where the pulmonary artery is starting, and then stuff like that. So, um, you can actually see right here, okay? You can see how the trachea comes down like that. It's a little bit darker right in this area right there. That would be my right main, main stem bronchus that would be there. And you can see a little bit of that lighter area there, which is my left main stem bronchus sitting right in there. Okay, so that's what we see. So all these are pulmonary vascular markings that we see in there, all those shadows right there. But you can actually do see those darker areas right here and right here, which would be by right and left uh, pulmonary main stem bronchus. Let me go ahead and erase those. Okay, erase all that stuff so we could just get all that out of the way so you can actually see it, how it looks without all my chicken scratches all over the place. And I'll try to point everything out again, you know, just so you get an understanding of where everything is. So here's the, here, right here be the right atrium. Down in here be the right ventricle. 
left ventricle will be sitting right here, left atrium sits right there. The aortic arch right there. Sometimes I say the aortic arch, sometimes you'll see the aortic knob, okay, an OB. That's another thing you might see right in there. So that's what you see right there, okay. Uh, down here, actually, you see a little bit down in here, a little area right there that, and sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't see it, and that's part of the inferior vena cava coming from through the diaphragm up going to the area of the right atrium, as we all should know at this portion of uh, point in time, okay. You sometimes see a little bit of a shadow of uh, this, this little shadow right here will be the shadow for the uh, 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 superior vena cava going into the right atrium as well, okay. And let me get rid of all these things again, and we'll follow what we can actually see. This here, right here, that outline right there, you can see the how it's darker on that area, and that area in there would be the trachea. And you actually see where right here it starts to bifurcate. So this area right here would be the carina that we talked about in class, the carina that would be there. Okay, and that's what we see where it divides right there, going to my area of my uh, left main stem bronchus and right main stem bronchus right there. So it's actually a pretty nice picture. One other thing I should probably just point out here, we'll probably talk about it a little bit more when we get to the gastrointestinal system, is that we also see right down here, you see a little area, a little darker, a little bit darker area. That's called the gastric bubble, okay? It's the gastric bubble. And what happens is all chest x-rays we know are upright, or actually <clears throat> most of them would be upright, okay? And what that means is air rises. So air will go, <laughs> would rise up. So therefore what we see is this is that air fluid level. Below that would be fluid in the stomach and that would be a little air bubble right there. Uh, one other thing is these areas right here, that little area right there, that area right there, are called the costophrenic angles. Okay, and these costophrenic angles are areas that we usually like to see clear. This is where the diaphragm come and meets phrenic word phrenic or phreno means diaphragm, costo means rib. So it's right where the ribs meet the diaphragm and that area should be clear. When people start to have um, uh, fluid or an effusion or blood or something like that inside the chest cavity, what you'll actually see is this area fills up. It starts to be white. So in a result, they don't get that sharp, sharp appearance like they'd see over here, but it'd be actually dull almost flat as the fluid starts to build up more and more and more. So this area would all be white down in here um, because of all the fluid be there and not sharp like we see on this side. So those are just a few things. Again, here's the clavicle, here's the clavicle. You can see part of the scapula, there's the acromion right there. You can actually see the manubrium right here. Here's the manubrium. Okay, this area right here would be the area of the sternal angle would be right about there. Okay, so anyway, that's what this, this particular image will show. And this is just another image that shows about the same thing. Where if you look at the image on the left, you get the true uh, uh, picture of of the uh, uh, of the, the chest X-ray. And on the right, you can actually see where the heart would be sitting in. They've just sort of superimposed everything on top of that, so you can see where everything is. So you can look at that at your own at your own spare time. But pretty much what we said again, this area down here would be the area of the right ventricle, left ventricle right here, left atrium would be up in here. Here's the aortic notch or aortic knob that's right in there. Uh, with the aortic arch, you see uh, pulmonary vascular structures, the pulmonary arteries and stuff like that. Here's the right hemidiaphragm, left hemidiaphragm. Don't see much gastric bubble. Here's the costophrenic angles, costophrenic angles, stuff like that. You can see the trachea right here. You can see they're going to, to the area of the, of the right lung. Uh, I don't see as much of the crine as we saw, but that would be like in that, that area like that. Okay, here's just another one, okay? And this is again, looking at the, pul the pulmonary hilum. Hilum is the area is like we talked about where everything enters or, or leaves the lungs, that's in there. And that's gonna be a combination of uh, vascular structures as well as um, uh, bronchial structures that would be going in there. Here's, see they use the word knob here. Here's the aortic knob right there. Here's the left ventricle, right ventricle be right here, right atrium, left atrium would be sitting up in there, okay? See the left hemidiaphragm, right hemidiaphragm that's in there, costal phrenic ankle, costal phrenic ankle. All these things are really important. Again, you know, with the more chest x-rays you, you look at, some of these things are gonna be going to be quite quite uh, prominent to you. You'll be able to see those things. Now, I mentioned before, 
about things versus inspiration versus expiration. Okay, if you've had a chest X-ray, what you realize is you know you stand in front of the the, the, the X-ray uh, plate, either you know a, a screen where they're going to be capturing an electronic image, or uh, for digital X-rays, or uh, in the old situation when they had film, and be standing there usually with your chest against that. And the reason why is again, um, if, what, by putting your chest against the screen or against the the, the film, okay, uh, things that are further away from the film get magnified a little bit more. So the, cl the heart, because it's sitting closer to the anterior chest wall, by putting the, the chest against the area of the film or the plate, actually has less magnification of the heart. So therefore, the heart has a more truer size when you start to see it radiographically, okay? But other things will change the, the appearance of the heart, well, whether, whether an x-ray is inspiration or expiration. And that's important. You know, if you've taken a chest x-ray before, what they'll say is, okay, take a deep breath, and hold it. And you're sitting there holding it. Oh, you hear that chugga, 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 chugga. And I'll say, okay, okay, you can breathe now. What happens is when I breathe, if when we talk about the pulmonary physiology, what's going to happen is the diaphragm is going to go down. When the diaphragm goes down, the diaphragm flattens out, which then increases the 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 uh, vertical diameter of the chest. So the lungs uh, will fill, okay, and as a result. The diaphragm is going down because of that because the diaphragm is actually causing that to happen okay now this is important because what happens if you look this is the same person over here the same people on both the left and right x-ray but the heart is a different appearance the heart on the left side with the inspiration film looks smaller and more vertical the heart on the right side with the expiration looks the heart looks larger and more horizontal and the reason why is the diaphragm is higher okay the diaphragm is higher which then as the diaphragm moves up instead of the heart being in, in a direction like this now the heart's more in a direction like this and therefore it distorts the the cardiac image and stuff like that also with an inspiration x-ray one thing you could actually see is if these were taken with the same quote technique okay which you'll learn about when you get into the program if you look at the lungs in this area and the lungs this side which side looks darker Obviously, this side over here looks darker, looks blacker, and the reason why is there's more air that's filling the lung, uh, the lung tissue, the, the little alveoli or air sacs. If the lungs are, uh, if there's expire after in, with expiration, well, a lot of that air has has sort of been squeezed out. There's still going to be some air that will be inside the lung tissue itself, okay, in small these little, in all these little air sacs, these alveoli. But because the, 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 the lung size is squished down because the diaphragm now pops up and the lung gets squished down, the tissue gets squished together a little bit more because it, and there's not as much air in there. And therefore, what happens is there's more tissue, less air. Uh, the air is what gives it that blacker color. So here, because the, the lungs are filled with more air, what will happen is that the, the, the lung field, these are called lung fields, by the way, lung fields. Lung fields will look blacker because they're more full of air. Over here, the lung fields are a little bit grayer. They're not as black. They're a little bit whiter, grayer, because there's not as much air there. Okay. So how do you know if it's an inspiration versus an expiration film? And that's really pretty simple, and you'll learn this later on. What's going to happen is you're going to actually sort of being able to count ribs. Okay. If you could count nine posterior ribs or seven anterior ribs, then it's a good then it's a good inspiration film. And if we look up in here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I can see nine ribs that are there. So if I see those nine posterior ribs, because the nine the, the posterior ribs are more horizontal. The anterior ribs are the ones that are they're angling down. Here's an anterior rib here, here's an anterior rib here anterior rib here, anterior rib here, but this area here is posterior, posterior, and this is this is one, you know, and two, and three, four, five, six, and all the way down, okay? So as a result, what happens is if I could count nine posterior ribs, I know it's probably a good inspiration film, and this is really important, again, because an expiration film, the lung fields look whiter, you can't see as much, as well as the heart changes in, in, in its position inside the thoracic cavity because now the diaphragm is higher and the heart changes from being a little bit more vertical to a little bit more horizontal. That's an important thing you have to learn on, learn about later on, okay? We'll talk, and again, um, uh, this is something you'll be here time and time again about taking good inspiration film for most chest x-ray sets, okay? And again, this is just looking at what we talked about and being able to count ribs, count ribs and you want to see what you want to see nine posterior at least nine posterior and at least seven anterior and so what we're able to see here 
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, just like we showed, because this is the same x-ray before. And you can actually see, this is the seventh rib coming down here, six. And you can actually see more. You can actually see one down there. So that's a good inspiration film, and that's what you want to see. Here's that gastric bubble. You don't see it quite as defined as we did before. Here are those costophrenic angles that we talked about before. You can still see the trachea right there. Okay, This x-ray might be a little rotated. I'm not crazy about it, but it's still there. still okay. Okay, this is an expiration film, and again, now you see the heart's more vertical, the lung fields are a little bit wider, okay, and um, as a result, um, you can't count the same number of ribs, the same number of posterior ribs, so therefore, what you need to do is, is in this expiration film, you know, what you do is you see a change in the heart size and shape orientation, as well as the vascularity. The vascularity looks a lot more congested, and the lung fields look a little bit wider, okay? And this is just, this is uh, something looking at uh, the, the heart size. One of the things that's commonly looked at is how big is the heart. And if a car, heart is large, it's called cardiomegaly. Megaly means enlargement. Cardio obviously means heart. And the idea here is to determine a cardiomegaly in a particular uh, expiration film, what you, all you do is you measure the transverse diameter from from the thoracic ca cavity, uh, and then you measure it across the cardiac di diameter from one that should be less than 50%. Okay, and this is obviously the heart size is more than 50% of the transverse um, thoracic ca uh, diameter. So therefore, this is a cardiomegaly. This is a cardiomegaly that's in there. Again, some things that will change that would be, again, if it's not a full inspiration film, you know, simply because the diaphragm is going to be higher and changing the heart size or heart location and, and positioning as we talked about previously. Okay. Uh, a couple things I just want to mention here and just to show you some images. Now, this isn't really the image. It's more of a diagram, but I'll show you some images. This is just showing uh, the coronary arteries. Okay. Uh, when we look at this one right here, here's the inferior vena cava, IVC, superior vena cava would be here. We're not worried about that. We're looking at the coronary arteries, okay? So right here would be the aorta. The aorta is coming out of the left, left ventricle right here. This area right here is the right coronary artery. And that right coronary artery is going to come out. It sits between the right atrium, which is right here, and the right ventricle, okay? Sitting right there, come along in that coronary sulcus we talked about before, coronary sulcus. And we know sulcus means a groove. Okay, so it's around there and it's going to go around to the back. As you see, it's going to be tailing around to the back this way. When we get to the back, okay, what happens is we have an artery that will be coming down the back, which we call the posterior descending. Okay, anyway, what's going to happen is uh, here's the pulmonary trunk. This is the pulmonary trunk right there. Pulmonary trunk trunk and what happens is it looks like shadowy right there the reason why it looks shadowy is simply because here's that posterior descending right there this is actually a marginal artery that's the posterior descending it's going to coming down the back i'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but anyway so here's my pulmonary trunk what happens is this right here is the left coronary artery this area right here it's very short because once it gets past the pulmonary trunk it's underneath the pulmonary trunk it actually sits between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk okay once it gets past the pulmonary trunk it divides one branch is going to be this one right here okay and that's frequently called the LAD which stands for left anterior descending Okay, sometimes it's called left anterior interventricular because it's between the two ventricles. Left ventricle will be over here, right ventricle, it says a little groove between the two. And what happens is the second branch goes around to the back and actually see it like this shadow right here. And that's going to actually meet with a functional anastomosis right there with that right coronary artery that comes around. This one that goes around the back is called the circumflex. circumflex artery okay and that's what we see let me show you some other pictures of how that goes now this is just looking at, at what we see um, we this is actually the, the this is right here it says LMS that's the left main stem or that's the left coronary artery okay and that's the part that's actually going underneath and between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta what's going to happen is that from that point once it gets past there we have that branch which is going to go right down here, which is down the anterior portion of the heart, which is my left anterior descending, or left anterior interventricular. 
artery. And this supplies a lot of the uh, left ventricle and the area in there uh, provides a good amount. So it's right in the groove between the left ventricle. This, well, it doesn't show it here because you have to think of things in three dimension. That's a problem with uh, radiographs. Radiograms, like I mentioned, are two dimensional representations of three dimensional objects. Basically, this is going around to the backside and that's my circumflex artery. That'd be the circumflex artery that's going to the back. Okay, and that's going around in that coronary sulcus around the left side of the heart all the way to the back, and that'd be called my circumflex artery. That would be there. This is the same thing that we see here. We can see the catheter. Here's the catheter sitting right there. This is the the catheter is sitting right in that in that in that aortic sinus, which is basically where the where the aortic valve would be sitting right here, and it's bulged out a little bit. Okay. Right coronary artery comes out one side, left coronary artery comes out the other side. And what we're seeing right here is his left coronary uh, angiogram. And here's my left anterior descending, coming down this way. These little branches that come off at a, at a diagonal direction, guess what they're called? They're called diagonals. We see them in both, okay? And here's the, the circumflex going around to the back. This is going all the way down to the apex of the heart and will circle underneath the apex of the heart and actually meets uh, with that, uh, uh, the right posterior inter interventricular or right posterior defending, uh, descending in sort of like a functional anastomosis just on the uh, on the posterior side of the apex. Here we go again, here what we see, here's the left main coronary artery. It's that little area right here. Here's the circumflex going around the back, and here's the left anterior descending that comes down in there. Okay, uh, uh, the right coronary artery seems to have a lot more of the innervation to the structures that are involving um, um, the the, uh, the heartbeat. Okay, when we talked about the SA node and the AV node, both the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery contribute to that area. However, it seems like the big one that does it is, is the, that the, the, the supplies the SA node and the AV node is the right coronary artery. Okay, and people when they have a heart attack or quote a myocardial infarction involving the right coronary artery, uh, frequently they, they used to call that, they give it a, a really attractive name, the widow maker because if it goes to if that if, it, if the blood supply to the SA node or the AV node is gone is decreased none of them work they don't work very very well they cause strange things most people with heart attacks when they actually die they die not because of the death of the muscle but be, they die because of what are called arrhythmias And arrhythmias are basically irregular heartbeats, okay? The heart beats irregularly. We talked about the efficiency of the heart and the blood being uh, filling of a ventricle and then expelling and filling and then ejecting and filling and injecting. Well, what happens is when we have these arrhythmias, it messes that all up. And therefore, what they're able to eject does not always uh, equal what they actually need. As a result, uh, it just makes problems worse. And that uh, creates all kinds of significant problems. People die from arrhythmias, usually um, relatively soon with myocardial infarctions, especially if it's involving the widow maker or the right coronary artery, okay? Left coronary artery will do the same thing. In fact, some people do have more contribution, contribution to that area by the left coronary artery, but most people still, it's mostly the right coronary artery that does that. Uh, again, this is the right coronary artery, okay? What we'll see here is here's the right coronary artery. Here's the catheter, that's the catheter. And this is the coronary sinus would be up in there. So it's filling the coronary sinus with the with the dye, okay? Uh, and, and that's what we, here's the posterior descending artery that was going down. And that what happens is that is that right coronary artery goes around to the back of the heart, okay? And then gives off a branch, that goes down towards the apex and continues on. Okay, and then that left coronary artery comes out this comes out this way, sends out a anterior descending that goes up through the apex and creates that functional anastomosis there, and that circumflex artery goes around to the back and causes a little bit of a functional anastomosis in the back like that. So basically, uh, you know, we get some blood supply uh, here and here from both the the left coronary artery you know, as well as the right coronary artery, okay? But this is just basic that, that, that posterior, posterior descending artery, and this is the artery, the part that's going and continuing on towards the area of the circumflex, because this would be the circumflex that would be right there, okay? 
Uh, this is me. Now we talked about this in class. Here's the aortic sinus. You can see the aortic sinus sinus really well. You can see the catheter right there. And the thing I want to point out, and why the angiograms help, and some people may be involved in in uh, interventional radiography where they're doing radiographs of arteriograms and things like that. And basically, what we see is right here. There's an area um, where there's a blockage. Okay, where the where the lumen has narrowed off. You can actually see that quite well. Okay, and basically, uh, they, here's the catheter. They passed the catheter on down there. There's a balloon. They did what's called a balloon angioplasty. Angioplasty. Nobody could read these writings. I don't know why I'd even write that. Balloon angioplasty, um, or what's called a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. The plasty is like the, bit the PTCA. Percutaneous means it's through the skin. They go through a needle through the femoral into the, through the leg into the femoral artery. Uh, transluminar means across the lumen or the or the channel. Okay, coronary because it's involved the coronary artery. Angioplasty. Angioplasty. Plasty means the surgical repair. Angio means repair of the vessel. And what they do is they blow up a balloon. It blows it up, and you actually see a little thing, a little wire mesh in there, which is actually a stent that keeps it open. So if I look the side by side, that area right there is this area right there it's open it's stayed open since that time again that was in 2000 2000 i'm still here um uh, much to the disbelief of some but uh, i'm still here okay and that's that now this is an aortogram aortogram and what they've done in an aortogram is you can hear the catheter here's the catheter you actually see right here they put dye in the aorta okay this part this area here would be the left ventricle and you can actually see right here see little, how it looks like a little area right there let me just erase that you can see that now they've see how it's whiter and almost like a it, it, you see an area that looks so sort of like this and this that's that's where the aortic um, valve is that's the aortic valve so here's my ascending aorta okay here's the aortic arch and here's my descending aorta coming down here. It's going down through the chest cavity, okay? And basically, this is this is sort of neat because I do see a number of things. Right here is the brachiocephalic, brachiocephalic artery, which we know is going to divide into here into the uh, right subclavian and going up in here to the uh, to the right common carotid, okay? This one right here is the left common carotid artery, and right here is the left subclavian. Subclavian, you can actually see how it's swinging around, going towards the arm. Okay, so this is the aortic arch. Here's the catheter. You can see the catheter right there. That line sexy. You see the end of it down here. What happens? They fill the aorta, put the dye up in there. Aortic valve would be right here. Here's that aortic sinus. Okay, ascending aorta, aortic arch with the brachial cephalic trunk, with the right subclavian. Right, internal, right common carotid, okay? Here's the left common carotid right here, and here's my left subclavian going to the arm. It's actually a pretty nice picture. I like it. It's pretty decent, okay? But that's what we see on this particular image of this, this aortogram. This is another one. This is digitally subtracted, okay? And this one I actually see, see things possibly even a little bit better, okay? Uh, I, I, if I... If I look at this, okay, uh, you see how it looks like the, the, the ribs are sort of like like a, a very faint shadow? You see in the back? What they're able to do is they're able to, to by, by doing multiple images, they're able to actually digitally subtract, you know, by an algorithm to be able to remove the vast majority of, of what you see at the ribs. This way what happens is they just see the aorta and they sort of digitally subtract, just like doing a Photoshop, taking away the stuff that you don't wanna see and leaving the stuff that you wanna see. So basically what we see here is my ascending aorta, okay? Here's the aortic arch right here. Here's the descending aorta, okay? And here's the brachial cephalic trunk, B, C, T, brachial cephalic trunk. And here'd be my right subclavian, you can see the right common carotid, here's the left common carotid, and here's the left subclavian. Okay, pretty nice nice image. And this white line right you see right there, that's the catheter. 
as they put the catheter in there to be able to inject the dye so they could get the dye inside there to be able to give this type of image. So it's really nice. So ascending aorta, aortic arch, here's the end of the catheter. You can actually see right there. They usually have a little loop on the end of it when it gets inside there, little, little, little loop. So that's the loop right there. Anyway, so here's the ascending aorta, here's the aortic arch, here's the descending aorta. And that first branch off the, off the aortic arch, the brachiocephalic trunk, which then divides into the right subclavian right here to the right common carotid, which would be right here. Here's the left common carotid, which you see, which is the second branch. So here's one, here's two, and here's three from our left subclavian artery. Actually pretty nice. You know, that should show that really, really well. Okay. And that's the same thing we saw. So this is now the, the one we just saw before, but now annotated. So you see the same thing. Here's the brachial cephalic trunk. You know, here's the here's the ascending aorta. Here's the aortic arch. Okay. Here's the sub, right subclavian. Here's the right common carotid, left common carotid, left subclavian, just like we talked about before. Okay. Now this is just another view, and I just want to bring it up for a, a couple reasons. Here's the ascending aorta. Here's the aortic arch. Okay, this should be pretty well. So here's the descending aorta. Okay, here's obviously the left subclavian, which is my third branch, three, two, one. Okay, and that's that. So here's the subclavian artery come here. Here's the brachiocephalic. Sometimes it's called the innominate artery. Most people will say brachiocephalic. Here's the, here right there is the right subclavian. Okay, okay, and here's the right common carotid right here. But the reason why I wanted to bring this up is to mention something that has to do with the subclavian artery on both sides. Okay. What happens is when the subclavian artery comes out on both sides, okay, there are there are two major arteries that, that come out of there. Okay. Right, there's a, a whole trunk. There's a thyrocervical trunk. There's a bunch of trunks. But the ones that we know about that we want to talk about is there's a branch that goes straight up from both. Okay. Straight up from both. And this is something we've talked about. And those are my vertebral arteries. We'll talk about more of those in a, little, in a little bit. And you actually see a vertebral artery right here, and you also see a vertebral artery here. This one's larger, so it's called dominant. This one's smaller, so it's less dominant right there. So that's the vertebral artery that's coming up. It comes right off the subclavian. It's, it's, with the, it's, it's the first major superiorly directed branch off the subclavian artery, both right and left, okay? One other thing I just want to show here that I think is also important is right where the, where the, where the vertebral artery comes up going up, there's also an artery that comes and goes down. You can't see it over on this side, but you actually see it right in here, okay? And that's my internal thoracic artery. We talked about that before. Then that comes down right on both sides of the sternum, just a little bit to the sides of the sternum. It comes down and, and has a functional anastomosis with, that in it, with those intercostal arteries that run below that groove on each of the ribs. That actually in those intercostal arteries, where do they originate from? They do originate from the descending aorta. At each, at each intercostal space, we'll have a vertebral, or where they'll have an intercostal artery that will come off at each intercostal space. And that runs all the way around below that groove on the inferior side of the rib to go to the front where it meets up with the internal thoracic. And that's not, the old name for the internal thoracic was internal mammary, internal mammary artery. And this is what we're talking about here. And this is just looking a little bit closer at the subclavian, subclavian artery. And sub means below, clavio means clavicle. So that's right below the clavicle. And okay, here's, this, here's the subclavian artery right here. And again, we see our vertebral artery going upwards. And then right here, coming down, just opposite uh, on the subclavian artery, is the internal thoracic or internal mammary artery. <coughs> we see the same thing over here. Here's the vertebral artery, and just opposite going down would be the internal thoracic or internal mammary artery. And again, that meets with those intercostal arteries. Um, the, the importance of that internal thoracic artery is they use that for bypass surgery, like I mentioned in class. That what they could actually do is they could go in and clip off where the intercostal artery is attached to internal thoracic, loosen it up from the anterior chest wall and swing it over and attach it to a coronary artery just past where the occlusion would be to be able to provide a blood supply. It's actually a great blood supply because you 
remember it's coming from uh, uh, only a slight bit further down the road from where the coronary arteries start from. You got to remember the coronary arteries are the first branch of the aorta right at the aortic sinus, you know, when going into the ascending aorta. But then the uh, next branch is going to be the um, uh, brachiocephalic on the right, which then gives off, becomes a subclavian, and then the first branch that is going downward, so the first major branch is going downward, is that internal thoracic artery, which we see there, and we see there. So it's actually a great arterial supply to be able to <clears throat> make up for a deficient blood supply to the coronary artery to start out with, okay? So that's what we have with that. This is actually sort of cool. I like this. This is actually a pretty neat, neat image. Right down here is the aortic arch. Okay, you see the aortic arch. And 10 right here would be the subclavian. Okay, here's the left subclavian. Left subclavian. One would be what? Brachiocephalic trunk. Two would be right subclavian. Okay, and then what we see is four is the is what's the, the four is going to be the right common carotid okay uh three is the vertebral artery okay and what happens is at, at this point uh, up in here the right common carotid is going to divide into an internal carotid which is five here's my internal carotid which is going to go inside the skull through that carotid canal which we talked about the base of the skull yeah like that yeah i like how everything comes back okay and that's going to go in through there Here's my and number the number nine here would be my left common carotid, okay? And up in here would be my left internal carotid. Because what happens is my internal carotid is going to go internal, it's going to go inside the skull. My external carotid supplies most of my face and, and some part of my neck and stuff like that. Also a little bit in the, in the throat area uh, with one branch, that 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 uh, middle meningeal artery that actually goes through that little hole uh, by the mastoid that goes inside inside the inside the skull okay with that little trough that we showed on the inside just underneath that that uh, just underneath that area of the terion right, we talked about before okay and what we see right here is here's a vertebral artery right here here's a vertebral artery and they're heading upwards and they're both coming off that subclavian okay so the vertebral artery is coming right here you can see a little bit where it's peeking out underneath and you can actually see how right there is where it's coming off the subclavian it's coming off the subclavian and what happens it gets up to a certain point and what happens is the Vertebral artery on both sides meet together, and that artery right there would be that basal artery. And they talk about how that basal artery goes through the area of the frame and magnum, and finally meets up right in this area with that internal carotid to create that circle of what you're talking about, Willis. Willis, that's an old reference. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so that's what we see on this image. So you can go back if you want to watch this again. Just go back a little bit in the video. You can see how the how all those things develop. But I could also show you another one. Here's a subclavian. Here's a right subclavian. Here's a left subclavian. So therefore, there's a vertebral artery there. There's a vertebral artery there. Okay, you can see how the vertebral artery kind of snakes up this way, comes together right here. Here's the vertebral artery. And remember that vertebral artery goes through those transverse processes, processes of the uh, cervical vertebrae. Okay, those transfer that hold that, that vertebral frame, and that goes the vertebral artery goes all the way through there, and finally comes up in here to form the basal artery, right in there where the two join together. And that basal artery comes in, meets with the uh, uh, internal carotid to create that circle of Willis. Okay. And that provides the blood supply to everything inside the coconut, inside the brain, inside the skull. It supplies the brain. Okay. You actually see here. Here's the aortic arch. You can see how it sort of swings from from uh, uh, right anterior to left posterior. It's going to go down the area of the back. Here's the pulmonary trunk right in there. You can see the pulmonary trunk's right there. Here's the here's the right pulmonary artery. Here's the left pulmonary artery. Okay. Now this is just a cerebral angiogram. Okay. Cerebral. Angio. And what we see here is this right here is the internal carotid. It's the internal carotid. And basically what they've done is they've put, a, here's the catheter down here, they've put the dye in the internal carotid. And this right here, okay, right there, that's that middle cerebral artery. That's the one that supplies. It's 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 it's, a, it's almost a direct shot. In other words, where the internal carotid comes in the circle, will it almost continues up as that middle cerebral artery. Okay, and this supplies a good portion of the brain. 
coming off of that. Okay, we'll show a little bit more about that. This is a cerebral angiogram that shows that. Now this is a nice uh, MR angiogram, MR magnetic resonance imaging angiogram that actually shows this pretty well. Here's a vertebral artery. Here's a vertebral artery here, vertebral artery here. Here's the internal carotid. I input internal carotid, okay? This would be the internal carotid here, right here. And basically what happens is we see the vertebral arteries come here and they form the basal artery. The basal artery then connects with that internal carotid and they create this little circle, okay? And that circle right there is a circle of Willis. Okay, here are the anterior cerebral arteries. There's two of them. There's a little connection right there. There's a little connection where the, the, the this part of the circle meets this part of the circle. They meet right there. Here's an anterior cerebral artery that comes this way, anterior cerebral. This right there is that middle cerebral artery, the one they showed on the last. Here's the middle cerebral artery. It supplies a lot, okay? A lot of the whole, uh, you know, uh, the good portion of the right and left hemisphere are supplied by this middle cerebral artery. And you can see how it's almost like a straight shot right directly from that internal carotid into that area of that middle cerebral artery. But this is really nice because you can see the little circle of Willis sitting right there. Here's the basal artery and the internal carotids come in to create that. There are other branches that come off of it. There's some cerebellar arteries that will come off the basal artery back in here that could be quite helpful as well. So that's just looking at a little bit of inside the skull with an MR angiogram, magnetic resonance angiogram, to be able to show you what that circle of Willis really looks like. Now we're going through the area. This is the thoracic aorta. Thoracic area, aorta. Thoracic aorta. And you can see right here. Now you see right here, 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 here. Those are all those intercostal arteries, okay? The intercostal arteries. And those are the ones you can actually see the catheter. Here's the catheter here, and here's where that loop is. You see the loop right there? Anyway, those are the intercostal arteries, and those are the ones that branch off the aorta at each intercostal segment. And remember that the, the, how the rib have a little groove, has, has a little groove on the inferior surface, inferior um, internal surface of the, of the rib, and that's where these arteries go around, and they go around the area and then they meet in the anterior portion with that internal thoracic artery. So the aorta is in the back right here, that intercostal artery goes around and meets with that anterior thoracic artery in the front. Okay, and that's what we see there. At this point right here, they're into the into the abdomen. Okay, they're going through the diaphragm, and this area right here we'll talk about uh, very shortly, which is basically the first first branch of the aorta once it passes through the diaphragm, called the celiac trunk, like right here. Okay, what we're looking at at this point. Okay, this is an abdominal aortogram. So now they're, they put the dye in there. You can see, see the catheter to the catheter loop. Here's actually the catheter. You see it down in here, coming down here. It's going actually down through here. Most times what they do is they put it into the right femoral, right femoral artery, okay? Just a little bit at the top of the leg, right below that inguinal crease or that ligament that, 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 where the crease is at the top of the leg, okay? And what they've done is they've just done, you can see an intercostal artery here. You can see an intercostal artery here. What happens is now the diaphragm is going to sit somewhere in this area right here. This is that first big branch right there. And what happens is the aorta has a large branch that comes directly forward. This is just a matter of maybe an inch, inch and a half below the diaphragm. Once the aorta passes through, and what happens is the diaphragm, if this is the posterior abdominal wall, okay, or posterior abdominal thoracic wall, just to the right side of the vertebrae, the vertebrae would be, would be, would be sitting right in here, just to the right side of the vertebrae, okay, there's a little bit of a, there's an archway, okay, it's called the aortic hiatus, and that's where the aorta goes right through. So this is passing through a small little archway on the back side of the diaphragm, just next to where the vertebra, vertebral bodies, I guess see the vertebral bodies here. See them all there? Vertebral body, vertebral body, disc space right there, disc space right there. Once it gets through there, it gets what's called the celiac trunk. Now this is a huge Okay, because what happens, the trunk is like a trunk of a tree. It gives off multiple branches, okay? This branch that's right here is going this way. That's the splenic artery, which makes sense because this area over here is where the spleen is, okay? So that's the splenic artery, okay? And that comes to the, goes to the spleen, very, very large artery, okay? What happens is another large artery branch goes this way, and this right here is the hepatic artery, 
hepatic artery that goes to the liver. Okay. Off that, we also have a couple other branches, some of the gastric arteries, the right gastric artery and stuff like that, as well as some duodenal arteries that come off that area. Celiac means abdomen or celio means abdomen. So therefore, what happens is celiac trunk supplies uh, blood, arterial supply to the spleen, uh, uh, to the liver, uh, to the duodenum, which is the first portion of the small intestine the stomach, the gallbladder, pancreas. Now we'll get some blood supply, like the stomach will also get some blood supply from other places, a little bit other, but what happens is the majority of that's going to come, the, the vast, vast, vast majority of the blood supply from the spleen, the liver, the duodenum, the stomach, the gallbladder, and the pancreas come from this trunk right here called the celiac trunk. Okay, let me get rid of the celiac trunk. Let's get rid of that so I could, we can could start to see some other things that are there besides the celiac trunk because there's a lot of good stuff on this uh, uh, abdominal um, angiogram. The next big trunk that we get off of this area, okay, is this one right here, okay? And this one right here actually sends branches down this way and sends branches out, goes into multiple different areas like that. And that's called, this one right here is called the superior mesenteric artery. Superior mesenteric artery. The superior mesenteric artery supplies the small intestine after the duodenum, because the duodenum is supposed mostly supplied by branches off the celiac trunk, duodenal arteries off the, off the celiac trunk, but supplies about 95% or 90 to 95% of the small intestine, as well as the first half, first, first half, first half of the large intestine. So it supplies, the superior mesenteric artery supplies a good portion of my intestinal structures. Okay, and that's that branch that comes off, comes, it almost comes off straight and be truthful what, what, where, it does, where, where it's interesting, it's a really interesting artery because what happens is the duodenum or the first portion of the small intestine, I'm gonna draw it in green, actually it circles around like this, okay? And what happens is superior mesenteric artery actually comes out, actually penetrates, it comes through the pancreas because the pancreas sits this little loop. We'll talk about that in the GI system. So the superior mesenteric artery comes through a little gap in the pancreas and over the top of the duodenum to go to the rest of the small intestine. We'll talk about that a lot more when we get to the GI system uh, next week, or, or when we get to the GI system in the course, whenever you're watching this this video. So that's a superior mesenteric artery. It supplies the small intestine after the duodenum, which is, and the duodenum is only probably about nine to 12 inches long, a little small C-shaped area of the, duode of, the, of the small intestine just after the stomach. Stomach, duodenum, very, very small area, okay? And then once we get past the duodenum, the rest of the small intestine as well as the first half of the large intestine, the, the ascending and portion of the transverse colon are supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. So that's another cool artery to be able to look at. Okay, well, we'll see a lot more of that when we get into the GI system. So remember the superior mesenteric artery. Okay, what happens is we also see two other arteries this artery right here and this artery right here. This artery is supplying an organ that comes here like this, and this artery over here is supplying an organ that looks like this. And those are the renal arteries. That's the right and the left renal artery, okay? Uh, this shows something very interesting. I'll show you about it and just, I'll mention it in just a little bit. But the renal artery then supplies the kidneys because renal means kidney. So renal arteries supply the kidneys, okay? Now, now one thing, you, if you looked at this, see how this, the, the, the left renal, this is the left side, this is the left side over here, this is right side over here. See how the left renal artery is shorter, the right renal artery looks longer? Hmm, why do you think that is? And it's because the aorta is a little bit to the left side of the vertebral column. Here's the vertebrae, right down here, you can see the vertebrae coming straight down the middle. So that aorta sits a little bit to the side of it, so therefore it has a shorter distance to go to the left kidney has a longer distance to the right kidney. So the right renal artery is longer than the left renal artery. Just another piece of worthless information that you'll probably forget. Or you want, you know, if you want to really sound important and, and knowledgeable to your friends and family, you can tell them that. And the, on the other hand, the vena cava sits to the left, or to, excuse me, to the right of the ver vertebral column. So the renal vein that comes from the right kidney is shorter than the left renal vein. 
just because it's the distance. So that's the renal artery, okay, that we that we see there. And you can actually see that see that quite well, okay. Uh, from that point, we got a couple other arteries that branch off, and you can't see it can't see it a whole lot. Uh, what'll happen is you can see a gonad go from the aorta. Other branches that are, are relatively large are the gonadal arteries, okay. But the one last one I do want to show here that I think is is actually pretty important is this branch right here comes off here, comes down here, and it's going further on down, okay? And this one down here is called the inferior mesenteric artery. And I mentioned the superior mesenteric artery, so which is this one up in here, supplies the first half of the large intestine. The inferior mesenteric artery supplies the last half, okay? And actually, while my, my, my colon or large intestine comes like this, okay? This first half would be superior mesenteric artery, and the last half would be my inferior mesenteric artery. There's actually an artery that runs that connects the two. It's called the marginal artery of Drummond. Okay, you don't have to remember that, but actually sort of cool. So we actually have a functional anastomosis between the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. So what you should know here, here's my celiac trunk that's right there. Here's my superior mesenteric. Here's my right renal. Here's my left renal. You probably have, um, it's probably in all this mishmash, you'll see gonadal artery going. And then here's my inferior mesenteric artery. Okay, it's the same thing we see right here. Here's the, This is the abdominal aortogram. Aortogram. And what we see right here, here's that celiac trunk. What's that? That's a splenic artery. What's that? That's a hepatic artery and stuff like that. Okay. Here's a renal artery right there. Here's a right renal artery. Here's a left renal artery. You can see the shadow of the kidney if you really look close here. Okay. Here's the superior mesenteric artery coming down here. Inferior mesenteric artery is sort of like hidden by all that. You can see maybe that's in the gonadal artery maybe that I see right there. Okay. That one right there. Might be going along. But the inferior mesenteric artery is small. Sometimes it's overlying the area of the aorta, and you don't see it nearly as well. But you can actually go back and look at that. Okay. Now, I, I bring this up. Here's This is the abdominal aorta right here again. What happens is from the level of the umbilicus, the navel, that aorta divides into a common iliac. So that's a common iliac on the right, common iliac on the, on the left. Okay, it divides. That's going to go to the legs. This is going to go to the right leg. This is going to go to the left leg over here. So here's the aorta. But what's this big shadow right there? That's called an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And what happens is sometimes the wall of the aorta gets a little bit thin or gets stretched out. And it creates this big creates this big pouchy area. Now the risk of that, it's like a balloon. You keep on blowing the balloon up and blow 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 the balloon up. What's gonna happen? Eventually it's gonna be blown up to its full extent and it breaks. So we want to try to avoid that. So a lot of times what they'll do is if it's less than about five centimeters or so, what they'll what they'll do is they'll, they'll watch it. it. Happens a lot in older males, males more than females by the way. What happens is if it gets pretty large, what they'll actually do is they connect a tube that'll go from here to here and then they have to actually stop the blood flow for a period of time above and below, okay? And then what they do is they, they connect the tube inside and then just wrap that wall, the, the aneurysm around. So they sew the tube from one side here to this side there. So now the blood's going through that tube, and they just use that tissue from the aneurysm just to fold it over, okay? Here's another one. Okay, here's a kidney right there. So here's a renal artery, okay? See, it's part of a kidney right here. Here's the abdominal aorta, and there's another aortic, abdominal aortic Um aneurysm okay and again if they're not uncommon okay here's that area where the bifurcation into the iliacs right here okay uh, but what happens they're not uncommon but on the other hand they just keep an eye on them watch them just to make sure that they don't break they don't burst they don't bust okay and that's the big thing because if they do bust guess what yeah that's pretty bad you don't want that to happen it's not a good thing because what happens you gotta remember all that blood in the aorta is going to go all fill up the abdominal cavity and you know it doesn't last very long after that okay so anyway that's just another abdominal aortic aneurysm here's another one okay you can see the aneurysm right there here's that iliac here here's the iliac here what's that what's that left renal Right renal. Actually, there's a dilation here of the area. This one right here is actually a little bit more significant than this one down here. This one right here, they only have to clamp off here, which means that they still get blood supply to the kidneys during the procedure. Because this is a, not a, they actually started to do things, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, sort of like uh, with minimal minimal type surgery, where they actually go inside with a catheter and fix it. What happens is this one right here, they actually have to stop the blood supply, everything below, to be able to fix it. So that becomes a significant problem. But that's just another abdominal aortic aneurysm or two. Okay. Now again, this is where the here's the here's the abdominal aorta, and this is right here where it bifurcates. Okay. And this is going into the common iliac, common iliac. And here's the same thing on this side right here. Okay, what happens? It goes underneath that crease at the top of the leg. Okay, and or it's going towards that area because it's going to create, it's going to continue on as the femoral artery. Okay, so once it gets underneath that crease, it becomes a femoral artery. What happens? A common iliac is going to divide into an internal iliac, which is right here, internal iliac, and an external iliac, which then when it goes when it goes underneath that crease. Out in here, this area is called the femoral artery. This area right here from the internal goes and then supplies um, a lot of the pelvic organs, you know, and stuff like that. Things are in the pelvis, all these branches. If you look, once the femoral artery starts, once the femoral artery gets into the leg, guess what it does through the thigh? Nothing. Okay, until it gets down a little bit lower right down here, and I'll explain that. So it's really not doing much right there. You don't see much branches. All this right here, this internal right here, is actually supplying all the, a lot of blood supply to the organs that are in the pelvic area. Okay, so because right about here is where we're going to start to pass underneath the leg and get in, or underneath that inguinal crease at the top of the leg and get into the leg. Okay, so now we're in the leg. So here's the common, here's the common femoral. And what happens is once it gets down below that crease, the common femoral continues right there. It looks pretty benign. Nothing's much happening, which doesn't happen. There's really not much of a branching off the femoral artery once it gets to a certain point. However, this area right here, okay, with all these little branches and all these squiggles and everything that's coming right there, that's called the profunda femoris. Or the deep femoral. Artery. This area branch that comes off the femoral artery, that profunda femoris or deep femoral, supplies all the muscles of the thigh. Front, quads, back, hams, supplies the muscles of the thigh. And because the femoral artery does basically nothing. Zero. It's it's along for the ride. It is eventually gonna do something. But right here in the thigh, it's not really doing a whole lot. All the blood supply that goes to my thigh muscles in the front and the back, my lateral muscles, my, my abductors, my adductor groin muscles on the inside of the thigh are resupplied by branches that come off this deep, fendral, deep femoral or profunda femoris. Okay? And that femoral artery right now is just saying, hey, I'll see you guys later. I'm just heading down the pike. I'll see you down at the end. So that's the femoral artery. It doesn't do anything. So back up in here is right the air is, is somewhere up in here is where that little crease is at the top of the thigh. It comes down underneath and you can feel that femoral pulse that's in the top of the thigh. That's what you're feeling right here. You're feeling this the artery right there before it branches off into that deep femoral, profunda femoris, which supplies the muscle of the thigh and the superficial or the or the or the you know the, the, the superficial femoral that goes all the way down. The superficial femoral, once it gets down, it starts to get into the leg, it actually goes medially towards the inside of the knee, okay? And above the level of the knee, it actually goes from front, the anterior part of the thigh, goes through a small little hole in a muscle and goes to the backside. And all of a sudden, that femoral artery that started in the front of the thigh goes medially, medially towards the adductor muscles in the, in the groin, comes around, works around through a little hole, goes around to the medial side and into the back of the leg, okay? And that's what we'll talk about next. Okay. Whoops. Oh, man, I should have done that. You, uh, anyway, you'll see that what happens is once that femoral artery gets down to the knee, which was on the previous slide, which I can't go back. For some reason, this thing won't let me go back. But if I go back, what happens is up in here, that femoral artery goes back behind the knee. So the patella would be in here. Behind the knee, okay, and the posterior aspect, we have the continuation of the femoral artery. But just as that uh, that subclavian artery became the brachial, or became the axillary artery in the axillary or the armpit region, which became the brachial artery, the femoral artery at the back of the knee becomes what's called the popliteal artery. popliteal artery okay and if you feel in the back of your knee with your knee slightly bent you'll feel you might feel a little pulse it's actually quite deep and that's the femoral artery 
then the femoral artery has a bunch of branches around the knee. They're called genicular branches. Genicular sounds like genuflex. So if you're Catholic, you know about kneeling and stuff. Kneeling involves a knee. Okay. And when they talk about something as a medical term, if you ever see the word genu, G-E-N-U, genu means knee. Okay. So anyway, that, that popliteal artery then swings around to the back. And we're actually seeing up in here, here's the popliteal artery. Now we're getting in the calf. Here's the calf. Okay. What happens is once that popliteal artery gets below the level of the knee, Okay, right where the tibia and the fibula come together. Here's the head of the fibula sitting up in here, and the tibia sitting right here, and there's a little gap right here. Right at that first gap right there is what we see right here. And this right here is called the anterior tibial artery. The anterior tibial artery. And what that does is, because again, the popliteal artery is in the back, and the anterior tibial artery must be, woo, must be anterior. It actually comes through a little hole in a membrane that connects the tibia and the fibula, comes anteriorly, and goes to the front of the leg. Now, if you feel the front of your shin, you feel that big muscle bulk in the front of your shin. You feel the bone coming right down the middle of that, that tibial crust, which everybody knows. You go to the lateral to the tibial crust, you got that big ball. That's where this area of the anterior tibial artery goes. It's going through that area, that muscle bulk. Finally, when it gets down to the level of the ankle, it continues on underneath this little band that holds all the muscles against the tibia, goes underneath that, and goes to the top of the foot. And that anterior tibial artery all of a sudden becomes what's called the dorsalis pedis. So if you actually feel the top of your foot, like between the first and the second metatarsal bases, you'll feel a little pulse there. Actually, about 80% of the time, about 20, 15, 20% of people, you can't find it. Okay, but you'll feel this what's called the, the little, little pulse right there, and that's the dorsalis pedis. And this right here, this right there is the anterior tibial. Let me get rid of my genicular stuff. Okay, okay, so basically, get rid of all this here. Okay, here's my anterior tibial, anterior tibial artery, which is right here, anterior tibial artery, which is right here. Okay, what's going to happen is, okay, is again, this is going to be lateral, lateral and medial here. Okay, what's going to happen is just after that, after the anterior tibial artery comes off, that the rest of that artery is going to divide, it's going to divide one branch going this way and one branch going this way. This branch right here that goes this way, this branch goes right here. If I have an anterior tibial, guess what I must also have? must also have a posterior tibial. And that's the posterior tibial artery. If you feel behind your medial malleolus, posterior to medial, medial malleolus, you'll feel a pulse back there. And that pulse you feel back there is the posterior tibial artery. That posterior tibial artery then goes to the bottom of the foot and then provides the blood supply to the plantar aspect of the foot. So that's the posterior tibial. So that's the posterior tib. And that's the posterior tib right there and right there. The other branch that's right here and here is called the perineal artery. Perineal artery. And that goes to the lateral aspect of the leg. And that lateral compartment with the, remember the peroneus longus or the fibularis longus, fibularis brevis, peroneus brevis, it goes to those muscles and supplies the lateral aspect of the leg. And that's the perineal artery. Sometimes you're able to feel it in the area just anterior to the lateral malleolus. If you feel the lateral malleolus, still at the ankle level, you might feel a small little pulsation, and that would be that area of the perineal artery. Okay. So what we've talked about here is once that popliteal artery gets past the knee, it branches off, the first branch off that, the big one, and it looks like it's almost like a right angle because it's coming straight forward. It comes right off that artery, comes straight forward, goes through that little gap, like I mentioned, between the, the tibia and the fibula approximately. And that's going to anterior tibial artery. So it's going anterior, covers the anterior portion of the shin. And then what happens is then it branches off into the, the posterior tib, which goes to the medial side behind the medial malleolus down here, and the perineal muscle or perineal artery, which goes laterally. And that's what we see down in the level of the leg. When people have like, a, you know, a, a ulcers in their leg, what they'll do is they'll do an angiogram like this just to see what vessels are open to see if, or sometimes if a person has, uh, uh, starts to get gangrenous toes, they want to know where the blood supply is. They'll do an angiogram such as this just to see where the blood supply is going to the